Heavenly Father, we recognize that it is true that you are holy, separate, different from everything else. We are all created. We depend on you, and yet you are the uncreated, the unmoved mover. You know all things. You have all power, all wisdom to use those two in the right way to maximize your glory. And for those of us that love you, that ends up being for our good too. As we transition now from a time of worshiping you through praising you through song to worshiping you through attentiveness to your word, would you remove distractions? Would you help us to be renewed by the transforming of our mind? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as we get ready. I would encourage you to open your own copy of Scripture to Ezra. We're going to be in 9 and 10, and we're going to finish the book of Ezra out this morning. As we do so, I guess I should issue our young people like these things called trigger warnings. They typically drive me nuts, but I guess I will issue a trigger warning of sorts. I'm going to talk about weird combinations, and when I think about combinations, I think about food. So some of you that are hungry, I'm sorry, we're going to talk about food for just a moment, and I'm going to talk about peanut butter and jelly first, right? It it is a good combination, something that we classically put together and taste really wonderful together. Well, maybe there's some other combinations that you might be aware of, like peanut butter and banana. This is something that the king of rock and roll, Elvis, really enjoyed, and he'd fry these sandwiches. They're pretty good as well. I've had those. Don't leave them setting for a while. There's just a tip. They turn brown or turn black and gross real quick. But that's good but unusual. Well, there's also this trend that we find on YouTube and other places where people just put the weirdest things together. And and if you eat things like this, I'd like to remind you that I'm always available for prayer after service because maybe you'll need it for the horrible indigestion, or maybe you just need a prayer for wisdom in your life. I'm not sure. Joke aside, though, I, I Some reactions are really important and really do have an impact on the things that we do. Like a chemical reaction, two things come together and something happens to it. The situation changes. And sometimes they can be very explosive in the way that they combine. I was in the office the other day with Sheila, and I guess I was avoiding work because I stepped out of my office and I was talking with Sheila, and I can't even remember what, but somehow one of those kind of general trivia things came up that I happen to know, that you could take some chemicals from over the counter that you could get, one store-bought item you could find anywhere, one you could find in a lot of places and specialty stops, and you could mix these together even by accident, and you could actually create a lethal gas that would come out. Now, she asked two important questions. Why do you know that? And what are you suggesting? And I'm not suggesting anything at all, okay? I promise. And, and because of the nature of those chemicals, I'm not going to list those out for you here. But there are things that even accidentally we can mix together that could have lethal results. And that's what Ezra is going to find. He is going to find a combination of two things that are not peanut butter and jelly, but are instead even worse than oil and water. You know how you mix oil and water together? They, you know, you can force them together, but they naturally separate. Well, this is even worse. This is something that's going to have explosive results. And he's going to have to come in and defuse the ticking time bomb. Now, for those of you that maybe don't remember where we are. We're at about 458 BC and Ezra has come onto the scene. I've made this point before, but yeah, I'm going to continue to use BC, but kids in the common classroom today will use BCE. And of course, that stands before the, com- before the common era. And then CE is the common era, and that's what they do instead of AD or in the day of our Lord in Latin. Uh, But I've joked about this before, but I've found this wonderful little take on this by Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. And he's kind of having a mock conversation, and it says, them. It's no longer BC and AD. Now we say BCE and CE. Me. Do you hear that, everyone? Now we refer to the eras as before Christ's era and Christ's era. Them. But that's not what that means. Me. Let us rejoice, for we live in the era of Christ. And I can just see some people cringing because they were doing this to distance themselves from Christ. But that's what we split our calendar by. 
right? That was the climax of history. But this, of course, is before that. This is with Ezra, and Ezra is coming on the scene in the Old Testament, and it's all part of God's plan to set up the Messiah. He's built the second temple now, or they have built the second temple now, the same temple that Herod would eventually make some improvements on and Jesus would walk into. He's preparing his people, and as he does so, God is working through folks like Ezra. And Ezra has lived his whole life, and he is one of those that have lived and grown up in Babylon, probably born in Babylon. Uh, and 70 years or so have passed since the exiles came back from their 70-year exile. And so the original folks that went into the land, they faded from the scene, right? The people that remember the original temple, they've passed on. So we have other people now that have grown up, and they, are, they have essentially taken for granted what God is doing. Ezra is excited to join this group of people that God is using to rebuild and reestablish his folks, his people, his kingdom in Israel, and he finds that they're broken again. Just like today, we often find, even in the midst of our excitement, that the people that we love and that we want to serve alongside or we want to serve with or, or worship with, you know what? They're broken too. We're broken. Unfortunately, these folks are broken in a way that needs addressed in a more serious manner than typical brokenness. They have broken some serious things. God loves us when he finds us in our brokenness, but he calls us to move past that and to do something about it. And so we're going to see that here, but they're broken in a particular way. Before we get into Ezra 9, I'm just going to tell you, he's going to find that they've intermarried in the land. But I want to remind you why that's a bad thing. Deuteronomy 7.3, we're going to start there, but I promise we'll get to Ezra 9, says, Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. So this was written back when they were originally going into the land and they were addressing the Canaanites. But this is actually a broader kind of issue. And we know this because Paul would later reiterate this for us as Christians in the New Testament era. He would say, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? And so even though originally it was talking about the Canaanites, this is a good idea in general. We don't become unequally yoked. The reality of the matter is, is if, you know, and this happens sometimes, oh, well, I'm going to date this person outside of the church and I'm going to pull them and make them love God. I'm going to get them into church. Doesn't happen that way normally. Normally, most of the time what happens is the person who is faithful walks away. They slack. They stop pulling in that regard and they compromise time and time again. And we saw this at this time in the Bible times for them, they would look back into the past and they would know that Solomon went astray because of the many wives that he had. And this is a common theme. And so God set this rule up, not because, hey, you have to marry exactly who I say and you can have no fun, but because he knew that when you marry someone, that impacts you for the rest of your life. He understands the seriousness of it in a way that I think many young people don't. Right? I, don't, I don't know that anybody understands how serious marriage is or how life-impacting it is until you've been married you know, a decade. And then suddenly, wait a minute, this, is, this has been a big deal. Right? The honeymoon phase ends at some point and you face real conflict and you have to get through it together. But he also knows what affects the individual in, uh, infects. I, I think I, that was a Freudian slip there. What impacts the individual does impact everybody as a community. So they were forbidden because they wanted to prevent, God wanted them to not have these trickling in of false ideas. So with that in mind, they've done it again. So let's dig in to Ezra 9, starting in verse 1. Now, when these things had been completed, that is the temple, the princes approached me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands according to their abomination. Those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. When I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe and pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard and sat down appalled. 
Now, unfortunately, leaders lead the way in both good and bad. When someone is an example, they're always being an example. You know, re- the reality is, is if you're a Christian, you're always witnessing. The question is, are you witnessing in a way that is glorifying to God? Or are you witnessing in a way that tells people that it's not that important to follow him? And that's the reality of the matter. And these leaders, unfortunately, they're leading their whole group of people astray by the compromising of God's word. Ezra has showed up on the scene now. They've kind of resupplied the temple. It's there. But now he's going to have to address the spiritual thing. Even though there's a physical building standing, they're not being pure to God. They were broken in disobedience. Now let's go and continue on in verse 4. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that it says everyone who trembled, so that implies that not everybody did. Many people don't care about the moral decline of a culture. And I'm sure that, you know, it should be easy for you to look, and Ezra is concerned about his own culture and its moral decline, And we can look around and it's fairly easy to be concerned about our culture and its moral decline, both locally and then then even to the state level. And of course, the United States as a whole. And we can look at what is celebrated today, not just accepted or tolerated, but celebrated today versus what would have happened 50 years ago. We have moved at a lightning fast pace in the way our culture has changed in what is okay and what is acceptable. And it is intense. But It's easy to look at the culture on the outside of the church and go, man, I am tired of seeing that sinful behavior. But what about on the inside of the church? Ezra starts inside. What about the salt and the light? If we're not being salt, well, then that, of course, is going to increase the rot around us. Have you ever looked at the church and gone, why on earth are these people behaving this way in God's name? And when I think of that, I think of these crazies, and I don't use that word lightly. This is the Westboro Baptist Church holding up sign like, signs like God hates you. Now, if we're commanded to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I don't think that that kind of, even if there's a grain of truth in there, I don't think that kind of presentation is going to help us make disciples. I don't think that that's loving people. In fact, although they put this veneer, this fake covering on that they're extra holy, I think they've actually matched and married into the world in the sense that they have taken the worldly idea of vindictive hatefulness and rather than God's love, and they have turned that and they've warped it and, and focused on God's wrath through this lens of hatred and superiority instead of love. If we are real Christians, if we are really following Scripture, we should look in the mirror that is Jesus and be stunned at how far we fall inferior of Him. We are imperfect, and so we should look around at our fellow imperfect people and look at them with love. We should confront the errors that they have as we confront our own, but that stuff, it's nonsense. But it's not just that, right? You look on TV and you, you, or the news or whatever, and you hear about these scandals where Christian leaders fall because of sexual sins. And of course, maybe on a smaller level, but probably a more personal level, we're aware of gossip that reflects poorly in Christ's name. Behavior that we should know better as a church and yet we engage in. Do we ever think about this? Because this is something that we can do more about than the world. And if we purify our salt, if we take our role as salt more seriously, then we can have a bigger impact on the world. I think we should be led to prayer as we look around and see sin. It should upset us. That is correct. But we should recognize, like Isaiah did in Isaiah 6, 5, that we are a a people of unclean lips, right? And as individuals, we're persons of unclean lips. So that's what Uh, Ezra is going to do, he's going to recognize that his nation, his culture that he loves, that he's moved from Babylon into with excitement, that they are a sinful people. Verse 5, but at the evening offering, I arose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn, and I fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. 
We, our kings and our priests, have been given unto the hand. Oops, didn't turn there. Sorry about that. We, our kings and our priests, have been given unto the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to plunder, and to open shame, as it is this day. But now, for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in his holy place. The idea is like a tent peg. They're stuck in the ground here. That our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are slaves, yet in our bondage our God has not forsaken us, but has extended loving kindness to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving, to raise up the house of our God, to restore its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Ezra was praying, and he takes a moment in the midst of recognizing how sinful they are to thank God for what he's done. Sure, ultimately, they still owe allegiance to the Persian king, but they have been allowed. They have been allowed to go back to this land. They have been allowed to rebuild a holy place where God has done much for their people. And note he says, our sins— We have this idea of radical individualism in the West. But they understood as a culture that, yes, the individual is important, but what the individual does impacts everybody else. You know, we kind of think marriage is, you know, it's it's my choice and it's just impacting me. Well, let's be be realistic. We just came from Thanksgiving and then we're going to go into Christmas. You know that some of the people around the table— their, their spouse is going to impact your family time, right? It's going to spread. And when they're doing it as focused only on the short term and their pleasure, and they marry someone not because they are going to increase their holiness, not because they're going to work together for God, but they're marrying them for the wrong reasons, and they find themselves married to somebody who is a spouse who will drag them down or lead them into compromise— Well, it's going to spread and impact the whole family. And here he recognizes our sins. You know, it's easy for us to separate out like, oh, we're the, we're the conservative streak or whatever, the sane streak of California, right? And and I think there's some truth to that. But on the same side, we're still Californians. We need to pray for the sin of all the Californians. So if Ezra was here today, he would go before the Lord as, as saying, Lord, we as Californians, We have forsook your clear commandments. We have forsook things that are clear and we should be doing and following. And we've chased after our own self. And we've chased after power and money and convenience. Father, forgive us. And so he, even though he wasn't guilty himself, he identified with his people who who were sinning in this way. Verse 10. Now our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from end to end with their impurity. So now do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or their prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. Now, they're in the Old Covenant, right? So they're dealing with different groups of people, and then they're dealing with them in a slightly different way than we are as the New Testament church, right? We're going to give the gospel. We're going to be salt and light in a specific way to them, and we want them to come and join our group. We want them to become Christians. We're part of the kind of the counter-rebellion, right? We're coming in on enemy territory and reminding them who the one true king really is and calling them to serve him. But there, they were in a time where God was using them to set the stage for the Messiah. And their goal or their role was really to stay pure and to cling on to him. And there was ways for people to convert in, as we talked about last week when we talked about baptism, and worship Yahweh through the Jewish people. But that wasn't their primary role at that point. But they were not even to bless these other worldly nations in a way that would strengthen them. And, you know, there's there's some parallels to that in the modern application. Not too long ago, we had somebody show up with a a piece of paper, and they were wanting to rent the building. And this group of people, they were crazy, just to be honest with you. They held completely unbiblical doctrine. They weren't, wasn't a a disagreement on the non-essentials. And so I, I looked at that paper and chucked it right in the trash. 
Sure, it would have been nice to have a little bit of extra cash for the church, but there was no way that I was going to aid them and no way I thought our elders would appreciate aiding them in any way and spreading something contrary to the gospel that was so blatant and clear. And so that's the kind of thing that we can deal with today. We can love them, but that doesn't mean we have to help them spread false ideas. We need to lovingly confront and correct. Continue on in verse 13. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you, our God, have requited us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us an escaped remnant as this. I'll pause there for just a moment. Did you catch that? God is punishing them by how? He punished them by letting the temple get destroyed, their capital, Jerusalem, get destroyed, by taking them away into 70 years of exile. And he's still saying that was not as much as we deserved. Right? We talked about some of the sins that they were doing, not just their intermarriage with the land, but that led, of course, to gross sexual sins, even child sacrifice, because some of that was going on in the worship of the land. So you might think, wow, it sounds really mean of God or old, you know, um, old-fashioned and not tolerant to say, don't marry these people. But if I put it in the context of, hey, would you want your children to marry into a family that committed child sacrifice? You'd probably understand the seriousness of the grave sins of these people and why God wanted them separated out from them. But he's saying, hey, we did a lot of sin and you punished us, but it wasn't even as much as we deserved. Verse 14, Shall we again break your commandments and intermarry with the people who commit these abominations? And some of those abominations were like child sacrifice. Would you not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant nor any who escape? Ezra is asking, how could we do this again? God gave us grace. He picked us back up after we failed him. How could we fall into sin again? But then he also asked another question. You know, the first question that's a good one for us to ask ourselves. God continually forgives us. How could we willingly find ourselves back into sin? That hopefully is a corrective for us and an encouragement to follow him. But the second question boils down to, God, have I blown it so bad? Or have we blown it so bad that you are just going to wipe us out and never use it again? You never use us again. I got some good news. God is patient and he is long suffering. Right? He is going to forgive them and use them as part of his plan. We're going to see the answer to this kind of pour out in the rest of the pages of history. God is still going to use them. But even though God is going to forgive them, he is still going to call them to radical separation from the sin that they've gotten themselves into. So he loves us and he will love us right where we are, but he does not call us to stay right where we are because he knows that isn't good for us. So we should be called to move forward. So if you ever feel like you're not good enough, you're kind of phrasing the problem in the wrong way. Of course you're not good enough. But praise God, Jesus did live a life that was good enough. Trust on that, not yourself, right? And our response to that should be following him out of a thankful heart, not following him out of some kind of pressure to try to earn something because we never could earn it anyways. Verse 15, O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escaped remnant as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. Today, nobody can claim to be some kind of innocent person. When we look around, we, we are all broken, right? We need the forgiveness, and he knew that. Let's go into the next chapter because we're going to move from prayer to action. 10.1. Now while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, and that's kind of just kneeling down on his hands and knees and really, really low. The house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept bitterly. This is a little bit of hyperbole, but in some way I really do mean it. I'm not sure if you have never prayed to the point where you're on your knees and you're crying, I'm not sure that you've really, really prayed. Like there is a level of depth in prayer that is so important to reach where you really understand the wickedness of this world because it helps you understand how good God is and how much he loves us. And we really do. I know men, we don't always cry, show our emotions very well. But we really do need to deal with them. And dealing with them before the Lord is an appropriate place to deal with them. And so they are upset. They recognize what they did. And we can't solve a problem until we recognize that there is a problem. So they recognize, yeah, we've blown it and we've done it again. 
Shechaniah, the son of Jehael, one of the sons of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Let's keep going. Arise for this matter is your responsibility, but we will be with you. Be courageous and act. Then Ezra rose and made all the leading priests, the Levites, and all Israel take oath that they would do according to this proposal. So they took the oath. Then Ezra rose from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashab. Although he went there, he did not eat bread nor drink water, for he was mourning over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. They made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem and that whoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the leaders and the elders, all his possessions should be forfeited and he himself excluded from the assembly of the exiles. So they have called a public meeting. Look, as a group, we've committed this sin. It's prevalent throughout our society. Let's come together and let's address it. And if you don't show up in three days then you're going to be cut off. You're going to pay punishment. And probably not everybody showed up. So they're going to have a plan and they're going to formulate how do we address this at a systematic level since this is so prevalent amongst our people. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the month and all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and the heavy rain. And so it's almost a a picturesque scene. They've gone from weeping and then now they're standing in the rain. uh, And this is the rainy season we're going to read. And they've come together. And this isn't a time where there was a bunch of gazebos or tents or things like that. They're out in the elements. They're called in a large number of people. They wouldn't have a, a, you know, nice outside heaters or anything like that. They're standing in the cold, in the rain, with lots of raw emotions. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful and have married foreign wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. And separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly replied with a loud voice, That's right, as you have said, so it is our duty to do. But there are many people. It is the rainy season and we are not able to stand in the open. Nor can the task be done in one or two days, for we have transgressed greatly in this matter. Let our leaders represent the whole assembly and let all those in our cities who have married foreign wives come at appointed times, together with the elders and judges of each city, until the fierce anger of our God on account of this matter is turned away from us. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, You'll note that uh, this was a result of lots of prayer. This is a command of God. There are some that argue that you look at other verses where it says God hates divorce, and it does say that. And we see that there are only a few legitimate reasons for a biblical divorce. And some have said, well, Ezra must have just jumped the gun here. But no, this was after intense prayer, and it says that this was a command of the Lord. This was something that was commanded. It is unusual, and we'll get there in a minute. But because of how prevalent they, it was, they've asked for some time. They're going to have to go family by family. They're going to have to check in with a lot of people and make sure that God's decree is done. Only Jonathan, son of Ashael, and Jeaziah, the son of Tikva, oppose this, with Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levites, supporting them. So there's, there is a little uh, dissension about this because this is a pretty radical separation. And I can imagine people going, oh, no, th- this is too much. We can't do this. We've, we've already been married for so long. That doesn't seem loving. Let's, let's work this out. But the exiles did so. And Ezra the priest selected men who were heads of the father's households for each of their father's households, all of them by name. So they convened on the first day of the 10th month to investigate the matter. They finished investigating all the men who had married foreign wives by the first day of the first month. Among the sons of the priests who had married foreign wives were found of the sons of Jeshua, the sons of Josadak, and his brothers Meaziah, Eleazar, Jerob, and Gedaliah. They pledged to put away their wives, and being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock for their offense. I'm not going to read all of these names here, but what you need to know is that they they started with the leadership. 
they started looking there and that they counted on a sacrifice for their wrongdoing and they also repented. Just like today, we count on Jesus for the payment of our sin and also we don't continue just to walk in sin because Jesus paid the price. Instead, we follow him in faithfulness. So I'm skipping some names here. All these had married foreign wives and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Now, this was an eighth month uh, long ordeal or so. And Ezra has arrived and he's gone through and he's orchestrated this setup and they've gone through and they've caused these families to be ripped apart. Now, this, this seems intense. And I want you to know that this is not the norm, right? We're going to see in the New Testament in just a minute that God focuses on preventing bad marriages. That's why there's a concern earlier that we read about what, you know, we shouldn't be unequally yoked. We don't have business with lightness and dark. We shouldn't be doing those things. So beforehand, select carefully whom you're going to marry. But this is actually a living picture and a harsh warning. This is a call to prevent the radical decay that had happened in the past. Uh, but for, for marriage, how do we deal with divorce? Well, for one, I think we need to be very careful with how we deal with divorce in the church. I grew up in a, in a very conservative Bible Belt area, and I grew up in a denomination where, to be frank, if you were divorced, regardless of reason, you were a second-class Christian. I think this passage does show that there are times when it is the right thing to do. Of course, the New Testament lays out what those things are with more detail. So let, let's look a little bit at how we should respond to divorce inside the New Testament. And if you find yourself married to an unbelieving spouse, what do we do? Well, 1 Corinthians seven twelve says this, But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever— and by the way, when he says not the Lord, he's not saying this isn't God's command. He's telling him, them that I'm saying this now as the Apostle Paul writing scripture, not quoting some past scripture, okay? He's giving them something a little new, does not mean it's not from God. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. So if you find yourself in an unequal marriage, that doesn't mean you have the excuse to go, oh, you're like one of those Canaanites. I'm kicking you out of here at the first fight possible. Sorry, that's not how it works. You should be a witness to that unbelieving spouse. We don't know how these arrangements happen in that day and time. It probably was because one spouse came to the Lord and the other did not. Well, there's hope, right? Hang on there. Keep praying. Maybe you can draw them in. The Lord knows the end result. You don't, so don't give up. Sometimes it takes people 15, 20 years or lifetime to finally respond all the times that they heard the gospel. And when they see the life lived out faithfully by their spouse, you know, eventually they're going to start noticing and that can impact them. But there's also this question about, well, when can you divorce? Well, Matthew 19, 7 says, They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? These are Pharisees coming to ask Jesus questions. And he said to them, Because of your hardness of hearts, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, the word actually here is porneia, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So except for gross sexual sin, and porneia is where we get our word from pornography. Very literally, it means adultery. But actually, at the time of Jesus, it actually had a large range of usages that was sexual sins. And that included intentional, willful withholding of sex within a marriage. Uh, that's a little bit controversial, but the Talmud clarifies that later. And so if somebody takes off and runs away from you for a couple of years and are not fulfilling the marital duty, well, then we got, we got some things to pray about, right? But this was all very tight and very, there's not a lot of outs. And at the time of Jesus, there were these rabbis that some of them were arguing, if she burns your toast, you can divorce her. That is not what Jesus was saying. He was saying that marriage covenant is so intense that there are very few reasons to get out of it. And they have to be very, very serious. And actually, even that picture of adultery comes back to the idea that marriage is a picture of God and, and, and the marriage to the church. Jesus, the son, and the marriage to the church and their unfaithfulness. That's why idolatry and adultery are so often compared, 
right? And so even then, you know, there's, there's something more going on here in a lesson. So he is saying, no, you need to be radically committed. But are there sometimes? Yeah. Unfortunately, there are some times where a spouse has run off. Or there's a, a time when somebody has committed adultery. And note, even then, it's you have the ability doesn't mean that you should. There are many marriages who today are still intact and they're worshiping God together and they love one another. But unfortunately, at one time, a spouse made a mistake, a serious sinful error. But then there are other instances where it doesn't matter where regardless of what one spouse does, one spouse runs away. What do you do? Well, we need to have grace for some of these individuals. And at some point, they sin and they've gone on, and there's actually freedom, to the ability to move past that. Uh, uh, I've shared in more depth in my newsletter articles and blogs that you can see on our website about some of my own experience with dealing with this. I grew up in a church where if you got divorced, regardless of the reason, you were a second-class Christian. And so even though, you know, the church that I got licensed in as a minister and all that and, and was baptized in and, and served in and celebrated when I got my first youth pastor gig elsewhere, all that kind of stuff, when my first wife ran off, even though I did everything in the world that I could to try to keep her there. And, and the church I was serving at the time, in fact, they thought I handled it so well. This is not a brag thing. They, 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 they loved on me. They prayed on me. And they said, well, your house is smaller now, but your house is in order now. It's smaller, but it's in order. They, they walked me through that with love. But that original church that I had come from, they publicly snubbed me and badmouthed me, even though I had committed no sin and had done my best to try to preserve that marriage. And I've seen Christians eat their own on this topic of divorce so many times it is ridiculous. The reality is, is that when you see somebody that's gone through a divorce, they're already hurting. Why are we adding to that hurt? Why are we turning them into second-class Christians, especially if we don't know all the things that have gone on? Because there are biblical reasons for divorce. But I think we need to be careful here. Ezra 9 and 10, it tells us that sometimes that's appropriate. But the real picture is, we shouldn't live passively in a situation that will cause us to stumble. It has more in common, uh, in, at least in our practical applications in our daily lives, with this passage, Matthew 18, 9, the words of Jesus, if your eyes cause you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter eternal life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Now, of course, this verse doesn't mean if you see a beautiful woman, uh, if you're a man and you can't control your lusting thoughts, that you rip your eyes off. Well, no. Plucking your eyes out, guess what? You still have a memory and maybe you've seen things in your past. But it means that we need to radically separate ourselves from things that are temptations and that will cause us to sin. I know in my own life, I got called a monk by a family member for doing this. After I got saved, there was some material in my bedroom that was not appropriate for me to have and I burned it in a barrel because I did not want to those things to tempt me again. I know other people who said, you know what? I can't have a smartphone because if I have a smartphone, I'm going to sin. So you know what? I don't do that. I just don't have one. So there are, I don't know what it is in your life, but you know those situations that cause you to face intense temptation. Why play with fire? Why continue to go back to situations or to set yourself up for potential failure? Instead, you need a radical separation from those things. A radical separation so that you can pursue God and not pursue your own desires that will lead you astray. Let's ask God for wisdom and how to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us. Help us to love our, love our spouses. This verse was about marriage, or this passage was about marriage, and we ask that you would make wonderful, holy, and healthy marriages a part of this church family, and that you would call us each to love our spouses self-sacrificially. And Lord, we ask those that are not married in this congregation that they would not give in to the wrong one just to get married, but that they would pursue you and be careful in that decision and that you would give them wisdom as they do so. And Lord, we also would ask that you would help us to prevent ourselves from falling into a situation where we are easily tempted, but that we would radically separate out the things from our life that might detract us from you or distract us from you, and that, that we would pursue you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here in person or for watching online. If you would like to dig deeper into what Scripture says about marriage and divorce, uh, and I can say that I'm 
wonderfully blessed with my wife, Heather. And so there is hope on the other side of those things. I'll be relinking some old blog articles on our, on our Facebook and things like that, but also talk to me. I'd love to talk with you about some of those issues or any other issues that you might be going through. We can pray together. Next week, we'll be digging in to the Christmas story, but a biblically accurate one. So we'll, we'll address some of those things that maybe you have heard about and kind of the kids' recreation of the story that didn't quite happen like that. And then we'll go into Nehemiah at the beginning of the year. But I hope that you have been to the fountain and gotten some spiritual food so that you will now go and be the church that the world so desperately needs. God bless you as you do so.